it didn't start out as a book. Um, I started uh, in 2012. I started. Um, I decided I want to do a documentary about the about the crisis, and so I started researching the the, the topic. Um, and after after some months, I, uh, I you know, I went through my notes and I realized that I'd I'd uncovered you know dozens and dozens of. Uh, of of articles of of interesting of interesting pieces of information, uh, but way too, way more than I would have ever been able to put inside a documentary, if not at the cost of you know taking away ninety five percent of the of the information that I'd found, and uh, I just came to the conclusion that making that sort of taking this incredibly complex story and condensing it into one hour or even one hour and a half of documentary film. Would not have done the story uh, justice, uh, or at least I was not able to uh, to do that. Uh, but no one else has been able to do it yet uh, either. So I think that's because it's a, it's a very complex job. So I was going through my notes and I realized that uh, I'd written my notes in quite a coherent manner. And so uh, going through my, going through them, I realized that you know there, there was there was there was already kind of a book there uh, in a very in a very simplistic form. So I sort of, you know, reassembled uh, the pieces of information that I had and um, found myself with 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 a book. Um, not the not the final draft, of course. You know, a very very early draft. But then I worked on it a lot in the, in the coming in the coming months. But um, but yeah, and I just sent it out to a few publishers in in England because I had written all my notes in English. So the book uh, was was in English. Um, and Pluto Press uh, in the UK. Decided to um, to publish it, and that's mm -hmm. that's how it went. So it was a book that came about by accident, really. You are going to do the documentary at the end, or not? Well, I would like to do it. I still I still dream of doing it. But my uh, my ideas about how that could be done aren't uh, are still quite quite foggy. Um, I, I, you know, it, it is a very complex story, and that's why you know I ended up writing a 300-page book. Uh, and even even in there, I didn't put all the information that I wanted to because the publisher, you know, made me cut it down to uh, a maximum of, uh, of of 300 pages. Um, so I think uh, putting that in 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 visual form or in a in a very condensed narrative form would be would be very very hard. Um, so at the moment, I'm sort of taking it uh, another way. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm working on producing short, uh, sort of short educational, you could say, videos about specific topics concerning the crisis. So uh, short, you know, maybe five-minute videos on public debt, or on the bailouts, or on whatever you name it. Um, and that's a project that I'm working on with uh, some some other people. So. Um, that that's where it's going at the moment. So uh, no pl no plans for sort of a feature length documentary on the crisis yet. Uh, simply because yeah, I still haven't figured out how to do it. It, it looks interesting. The battle for Europe: How an elite hijacked a continent. Who is that elite that uh, hijacked Europe? Well, it's um, it's a very um, it's, it's a very varied elite. Uh, it comprises, obviously, uh, the the sort of European technocracy, so the European Commission, uh, the, the European unelected technocracy, so the European Commission uh, and the central bank, certainly. Um, it also includes um, certain power structures, the, the establishment of certain countries, what you could call the most powerful countries at the moment in, uh, in Europe, uh, first and foremost uh, Germany, uh, or certain elements of the German establishment. Uh, it also comprises behind the scenes, you could say, uh, powerful players on, in the financial markets, uh, big banks and so on. Um, it certainly also comprises uh, the the creditors, the official, you know, the, the creditors uh, that hold um, that hold the bonds, uh, the public bonds of uh, 
European member states. So um, it's a very it's a very varied elite. Um, so it includes many 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 different players. Um, I think these are these are just a few. Uh, of course, you know you've you've also got the the major companies, uh, the big sort of corporate companies in Europe, who are clearly uh, benefiting from the uh, from the austerity and wage compression and privatization policies currently being pursued in Europe. So, uh, so yes, it's a very um, it's a very big big team of players, uh, all of which are, are, have something to benefit from the policies that are being uh, that are being imposed in Europe at the moment. At the end, it seems that uh, there are the people on the financial system that are the, the main people who have benefit from that. No? But uh, why European politics, the ones on the European countries, governments, accept the, the dictatorship of the financial system? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. And uh, I don't think there's any, there's any easy answer for that. Um, I think, I mean, I can only speak, uh, I can mostly speak for Italy, and I can say that uh, it's, in Italy's case at least, um, I think a lot of politicians are basically uh, very, very um, ignorant about, the, about what's happening in Europe at the moment. Um, I think it's a very telling example that, uh, that with an overwhelming major majority uh, our parliament uh, approved the uh, the fiscal compact uh, back in 2012 after uh, they say you know uh, a debate of just a few minutes uh, and uh, and they approved the, the fact that the, that the the fiscal compact be put in the Italian constitution, which was something that the fiscal compact um, didn't actually require. Um, I don't think they had any self interest in. It, Except for maybe self, except for maybe survival, for doing that. I mean, they clearly didn't benefit directly from uh, from the approval of the fiscal compact. Um, I honestly think they didn't really know what they were doing and did not understand the implications of um, of what they were doing. So I think uh, a lot of uh, politicians and in, in, in especially in periphery countries have really given up on the pursuit of uh, of, of national interest. Um, at any level, and the pursuit of the welfare of their citizens, and are mostly interested just in uh, just in uh, preserving their political careers. Uh, so I think it's very much a question of uh, of basic basic survival. They know that if they go along with, uh, uh, they think that if they go along with uh, the European policies, then they'll have a better chance of uh, of getting. Of, of of surviving politically, uh, even though that's not always the case, uh, or maybe of finding a good job in some uh, in some European institution or private institution, even uh, when they uh, when they when they leave politics. So um, I think it's a I think that's the main reason why a lot, why a lot of politicians went along with these policies. Of course, there's also an ideological uh, element there, in a sense that, of course. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of these politicians uh, subscribe uh, entirely to, uh, you know, the sort of neoliberal ideology which has taken place, uh, which has taken hold uh, in, uh, over the course of the past thirty years. So uh, I think, you know, a lot of them might 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 sincerely think that these policies are <laughs> are the best, the best possible policies. Uh, you know, I think there's 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 different reasons. But that's that's a good question. I don't think there's any straightforward answer for why um, for why national politicians have gone along so easily um, with these policies. Nobody stands the the fight against austerity. Austerity, you know, even the socialist governments. Uh, the last one to surrender has been France. Uh, why? They have fear of of who or, or what? <sighs> I think it's. Um, I think, in a way, it's 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 a demonstration of how of how politics has changed over um, over the course of of the past decades. I think it's there's you know it's mainly a lack of courage and a lack of belief in the ability 
of politics to you know change the course of history you could say and uh, especially of a single country being able to change the course of even european uh, european history and i think again that that has a lot to do with this now with this neoliberal narrative which uh you know we've been hearing you know for 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 so long and that is that politics doesn't count anymore that now all the power is in the hands of the markets that they are the ones to dictate policy um and of course, you know that's only so because politics allowed the markets to uh, to accrue so much power. But I think a lot of politicians lack um, lack courage, lack um, initiative, mainly because they've interiorized this idea that you really this almost messianic uh, idea of politics, whereby you know you, even individual countries are up against such such massive powers. That it's uh, that you know resistance is futile. Uh, I think um, I think that that's part part of the problem, um, and uh, and of course a lack of ideas. I think that's that's a very big problem, especially when it, you know it, again I return to Italy, and it's very clear that you know even if uh, our politicians wanted to change the course of European policy, I mean I I, I think for example of our uh, our recently nominated Prime Minister Matteo Renzi, uh, you know, even if he even if he wanted to uh, oppose these policies, he really does not have an alternative vision for how things could be. So, of course, how can you fight the status quo if you don't have an alternative to offer? Um, and again, that, that's that's I think that has to do with how politics has changed, also in relation to uh, to you know the media and the internet. I mean, it's my impression that, and of course, I, I know a lot of people that work in politics, and what they all say is that really these politicians, all they do is uh, they spend pretty much the entire day reacting to uh, what people say on Twitter or on Facebook or what some newspaper says uh, or some internet page. All they do is react, is react to the inputs they get from, uh, from, from the outside world. And of course, nowadays that happens 24-7. Um, so most of these politicians really, they don't even take five minutes a day to sit down uh, and and think and confer with uh, with um, with their assistants, you know, and and and, and reflect on on policies. Uh, it's all very much, you know, day to day. Um, it seems, uh, and of course that translates into a, an absolute lack of. Um, of uh, of vision when it comes to um, to alternatives. Mm -hmm. During the crisis, it was usual to hear that uh, Italy, Spain, Greece, Portugal have lived over their possibilities. Mm -hmm. Now we have heard uh, Manuel Valls, the French Prime Minister, to say the same: "Friends have lived over their possibilities." Are we condemned to live worse than before the crisis? Well, um, no, I don't think so. I mean, there's no, uh, there's nothing, nothing natural about what's happening uh, in Europe um, at the moment. There's nothing natural about the worsening of uh, our economic, social uh, conditions. It's uh, it's purely the result of political choices, uh, which means that if we uh, if we um, if we found the means to change the policies, then we could also change the outcome and change uh, the future that uh, that we face and that future generations face. It's uh, I think it's purely a matter of uh, it's purely a matter of political action. And of course, you know that's uh, that's a big if, uh, given the current balance of uh, of power at the moment in Europe. But um, I don't think there's any reason to be a pacifist or, or even defeatist. Uh, I think uh, I think citizens have faced much much uh, harder struggles, uh, and workers have faced much much harder struggles in the past than they face nowadays. Um, that's why I you know I always get a bit, a bit angry when I when I see you know my peers and you know uh, people from my generation being so disillusioned as if they really do live in uh, you know in the in in. In, in the hardest possible political context, 
that's that that there's ever been in history uh clearly that's not the case i mean of course we face a very hard struggle but uh you could say that uh the past generations faced much much harder struggles than the ones that we do today so i think it's uh it's really it's really a question of um of of, of refining faith in uh in the ability of uh, of people to collectively come together and decide uh, and decide decide their fate uh, I think it's it, 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 it comes down to that really, um, and that's one of the one of the reasons that I wrote that I ended up writing this book, and one of the reasons that made me start the project in the first place was um, was really to um, to try to to dispel a lot of the myths you know that people uh, that, that 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 people had accepted about the crisis, and I think that's still very true nowadays. I think a lot of people have relatively passively accepted these policies because deep down they really do believe that you know there is no alternative Tina I think a lot of people really do believe in Tina uh, the idea that there really is no alternative to these policies because you know after all we're running out of money you know we keep hearing that the whole time don't we you know Europe is running out of money and so we have to cut back uh, and of course you know no one not no one likes that but that's what that's what you do when you start running out of money, um, and I, I see that in Italy, for example. I mean, I think there's a, a lot of people have, have have accepted this as a sort of as a kind of a, a objective objective truth, and that's clearly not that's clearly not the fact. Uh, you know, we know that Europe still is the largest economic region uh, in the world, uh, even larger than North America. So uh, it's clearly not a question of the money not being there. Um, that's absurd. You know, Europe is still richer than it's ever than it's ever been in its history. So the idea that there's not enough money is is just ludicrous. Uh, the question is, where is that money, and who holds that money? And of course, that's 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 one of the main problems in Europe. You know, is the is the fact that such a large part, of course, not just of Europe, uh, it's the same problem in the U.S. That so, a huge part of the national wealth is held by a very, very small percentage of citizens. And of course, this is one of the main reasons why uh, so many people are getting poorer. And even governments are poorer and poorer, despite the fact that we, we, there is so much wealth um, around us. <clears throat> Just two or three more questions. In the title of your book, you write, How We Can Take It Back Europe. Mm. How, can, how can we? Well, I think... Uh, it's it's not easy, but I think the first step is um, is overcoming there's uh, these uh, artificial uh, national barriers that politicians have erected, and of course uh, not just politicians, financial markets and so on have erected between countries. So now we have you know the Germans who blame the lazy Southerners for all the problems in Europe, and the Greeks and the Italians and the Spanish who blame the Germans. For all their problems, and um, and really, uh, I think you know, financial markets and the elite has been very successful in pursuing this kind of divide and conquer strategy in Europe. So I think the first step in changing things is realizing that the overwhelming majority of Europeans from all countries have a common interest in uh, in changing the policies. Um, it's not it's not a question of German workers versus versus. Uh, Greek workers, it's um, the real division is a, a, a class division. I mean, what we see is that in all countries, uh, national elites have been uh, have been have been accruing huge amounts of wealth at the expense of workers, and the same goes uh, same goes for Germany too. Uh, of course, Germany was one of the first countries to pursue these austerity policies, uh, especially in co concerning wages beginning in 2003 and 2004 when they started really sort of keeping wages down to promote their export sector and this is something that went totally to the detriment of, uh, of German workers and this is what allowed Germany to become so uh, so competitive um, so of course it's also in the interest of German workers to um, to uh, to pursue an alternative an alternative policy uh, you know this uh, the German export led economy has gone and the benefits of this export-led economy have mainly gone, you know, to uh, to big business, um, to the big 
to the big to the big exporting companies. Uh, you know, a very small percentage of that has gone to the actual German workers. So I think first of all, we have to uh, realize that as European citizens, as European uh, workers, uh, students, and so on, we have a common interest, uh, and that common interest is um, is is gaining. Uh, is really regaining control of, of of European politics at the European level. Obviously, you know, I mean, I think uh, I don't subscribe to the idea that the solution to the crisis is, is to return to national currencies or to break away from the euro. I think uh, it, precisely because the real enemies that we face are not the Germans or the Finnish or, or, or the Greeks, but the main enemy that we face is uh, financial markets, transnational capital. That's the, that's the real enemy of, of European workers and citizens. Uh, and of course, uh, no individual country alone can, uh, has the power to, uh, to, face up to, these, to face up to these powers. The only chance that we have to face these powers is to come together as a united euro, as a united euro, even as, as a united currency. I think that's very important. Um, only, 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 that's the only way I think we can... Um, we can really face face up to these powers, but of course that means you know regaining control of the European political system. Uh, so um, you know I think we ha we have to of course change comes from the bottom up, but it also comes from the uh, from the top. I mean I think we have to get inside the European uh, um, political system, and that's why I think the work that uh, Alexis, Alexis Tsipras uh, in Greece is doing at the moment. Uh, in um, in accepting, you know, the candidacy uh, for the Commission on behalf of the European Left parties, I think that's uh, I think that's a very very important signal, and the fact that he's Greek, I think, gives it um, uh, has a, has an important symbolic uh, symbolic value, and I think he's he's doing a great job in really uh, uniting. Uh, people on the left from different countries, different backgrounds, behind a common uh, a common program for change at the European level. Um, and I think you know, if you look at Italy, for example, I think uh, that's I think what we see as one of the first cases in history. I think where ordinary citizens came together and formed a political list, uh, nominating a politician from another country. In this case, Greece, Tsipras. Uh, I think that's uh, I think that's a thing of great symbolic value, and I think it's the, it's a sign that something is is changing. So, of course, I hope that um, that 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 Tsipras will have a good turnout at the European elections, and um, and that that signals, you know, the first step in uh, in changing things at the at the European level. Of course, that's just one of the many levels that we have to work uh, that we have to work at. There's Many other levels that we can that we can do work at, but I think uh, I think something I think something is changing in that respect. So um, it'll it'll be interesting to see what the what the outcome of the, of the elections are. They might not be as uh, as disastrous as uh, everyone is predicting. But it seem, it seems uh, very difficult uh, to Alexis Tsipras to gain the president of the European Commission. No? Well, of course. <clears throat> Obviously, he has no chance of gaining the presidency. I mean, that, that's very clear. What we have to aim for is for a change of the balance of power within the European Parliament. Uh, and, of course, if, um, if the European uh, left parties manage to get sufficient votes at these elections, they'll have bargaining power. And they'll have power also over the, 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 uh, the socialist and Democrat, Democrat group. Um, of course, you know, we have to, we have to keep the, the heat and the pressure on the on the on the center on the center left coalition in the European Parliament to uh, to really break away from current policies and even there you know I, we see small signs of change uh, at least in words you know we see Martin Schulz the the the, the, the socialist candidate for for the Commission uh, who many people uh, consider to be the most um, likely uh, winner in the future elections has has made some quite uh, radical statements about the need to overcome neoliberalism, to overcome austerity policies. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, what Alex Tsipras and what we all will have to do, you know, uh, after the elections is really to, heat, to keep the heat on, 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 the, on the socialists to, uh, 
to, 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 stick, to stick to their, to, to stick to their electoral promises, to change course, to, work to, to, uh, to overcome the austerity policies and, uh, and really give Europe a, a new start. Um, and of course, you know, the more power we have in the European Parliament, the better chance we have of, uh, of steering the socialists in the right direction. For ending, uh, there is a lot of people in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, uh, Ireland, uh, disappointed. You talk about them. Uh, they, they, they think that there is no future, no solution. What would you tell them? I think that uh, it's, um, as I said earlier, I think it's, uh, it's, I know it's a very tough situation for uh, for everyone, for, for a lot of people, in a great in a great number of countries, but I would uh, I would counsel people against looking for uh, for easy solutions, uh, which is what the nationalists and the populists uh, on the right uh, have to offer. Uh, you know the idea that, as I said earlier, uh, all the problems come from the euro, and leaving the euro is a solution to all our problems. Uh, I really don't think that's the case. Uh, I really think that that may seem like the easy way out, but it's uh, it's not a real solution at all. Um, I think we have to uh, we have to realize that it's 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 really it's really up to us to uh, to change things, and, to, and we uh, we have to start from the from the national level again. Uh, you know, there, there's no reason to believe why that can't be done. I mean, there's no there's no there's no uh, intrinsic reason why we shouldn't be able to uh, to change uh, to change the course of history. It's really about you know. Um, uh, overcoming this idea that 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 now all the power is in the hands of the markets, uh, I think that's as I said earlier, that's only because we gave uh, markets that power, and in this, just as we gave them that power, we can take it back, we can take it away. Um, so I think we have to we have to uh, we have to find faith once again in the power of of, of people to. Um, to collectively decide decide the fate of their countries and uh, of, of of Europe as a whole, um, I think you know if we uh, if we come together, we can do it. There's no reason to believe why we uh, we shouldn't be able to do it. Um, and besides, we don't have any other choice.